Andre's uh, um, research expertise is especially in numerical uh, modeling as well as experimental investigation in heat transfer fluid flow as well as solidification sciences of metallic alloys. He completed his PhD at uh, University of British Columbia. After completion of PhD, he moved to uh, Ecole Polytechnic in Switzerland to work with, I think, uh, Professor Rapaj, if I if I am correct, okay. And then uh, later he moved to uh, University of British Columbia and started his uh, faculty job as assistant professor. And a couple of years back, he moved to McMaster University to take up the chair uh, professorship of ferrous metallurgy as well as Arcelor Mittal and Dofasco uh, chair professorship at McMaster University. Thanks, Prakash, uh, for that introduction. And I'd like to Thank you all for this invitation to come and give uh, this invited talk. Yeah, uh, so be, be, before I, I be, begin, I, I like to make a few uh, acknowledgements. Of course, as most of us uh, are, you know, are, are aware, it's really our graduate students that do our research for us, right? And so I, uh, most of what I'll be presenting Today is the is the work of four grad graduate students within our McMaster Steel Research Center. So that's Yi Fang, Angshuman Potter, Camille Shilby, uh, and Araf Al Rafi. The the work is also done in collaboration uh, with uh, my colleagues Ken Coley, um, Neslahan Dogan, and Stephen Tullis. And I'd also like uh, to acknowledge uh, support from Arcelor Mittal, Gerdau, Nucor. Stelco, Tata, and U.S. Steel, who have supported the, this research, and also my collaborators, Joydeep Singapta from ArcelorMittal de Fasco here in Hamilton, and Brian Thomas from the Colorado School of Mines. So as some, some of you know, um, McMaster is, of course, in Canada, in the province of Ontario, in the town of Hamilton. Uh, and if the United States uh, Steel Town is, of course, Pittsburgh. Uh, in Canada, Steel Town is ha Hamilton. And so, for about the last 20 years, uh, we've run here at McMaster University the McMaster Steel Research Center. Uh, and so, it, it was formed in the year 2000, uh, really to su support the steel industry in, in graduating uh, know knowledgeable gra graduate students to ensure that we remain on the, the leading edge of our R&D and thus in steel production um, that we, of course, conduct uh, along with that industrially relevant research. And we also provide continuing ed education. So ev every year we give a, a course on coke making uh, and a course on the blast furnace. Um, so our Steel Research Center has 12 member com companies. Uh, we support 11 faculty, including four uh, research chairs, uh, including my, my own re research chair. Um, we really um, ca carry out research uh, on many aspects of the steel making and steel and steel processing. Beginning from direct reduction iron making all the way to galvanizing um, steel products um, and process control to support uh, every process from those two extremes. Right. So um, I, I like to show th this graph. It really highlights uh, the global production of steel and where is it placed in the realm of all of the materials that we create, right? And so in the, this graph here, what we're highlighting um, is steel's place, which, it, which is the fact that it is the number two most produced material in the world, right? Um, so if we can compare what it looks like in, in blocks, let's say, as we see here, right? So cement, you know, 4.1 billion tons of cement are produced each year. So and steel is second on the list at, at 1.8 billion tons. So any small changes that we make in processing, uh, in quality in improvements, have, have a significant effect simply because of the extreme volume of, of steel that is produced. 
Now, the, the, the defects that we're going to focus on discussing today uh, really relate to the continuous casting process uh, of steel making. And if we look at the, the steel making process, right, so of course here we have a continuously cast slab, right? Um, if we look then at the microstructure that's produced from that, right? So what, what, what we can, what, I hope everybody, let me just put the, the laser pointer in here, pointer options. Um, there's the laser pointer, right? So of course, here we have the microstructure of uh, steel that forms during continuous casting. We know that we form columnar dandrites on the surface um, and then um, on the in, in interior at some point, we'll have a columnar to equiax transition and we'll form equiax grains that will pile up uh, towards the, the center and entrap in liquid pockets. And because of that, um, what we can form then are these two interrelated defects, right? Which is, of course, hot tearing or cracking in the semi-solid, as well as centerline seg segregation. So the formation of these defects is a multi-scale and multi-physics pro problem, meaning that we have to in include elements of solidification, heat transfer, fluid flow, stress strain, and as well as examine this problem, both from the scale of the process, as well as the scale of the microstructure. And so we, we really need to be able to have the long range stresses and strains, some of the, the processing conditions um, that, that play a, a major role, as well as be able to separately examine the liquid phase and the solid phase. Now, the, the other uh, big problem in continuous casting that limits uh, through, throughput and can result in def defects is, of course, no, not nozzle clogging, right? And so here we're, we're primarily concerned with the submerged en entry nozzle and understanding how, how does the nozzle clog, what are the effects of different in intermetallics that might cause clog the nozzle and can we support understanding what steel chemistries will enhance nozzle clogging and so how can we then perhaps modify um, modify the steel chem chemistries to to reduce the, the nozzle clogging okay so here we have a brief outline uh, of my talk and really what I've done here is I've summarized um, the diff different areas of research that we're working on right, right now uh, to, de to develop a fundamental suite of models here at McMaster to improve the continuous casting process. So we're, we're working on a model uh, of inclusion development um, and we're focusing that model on silicon manganese killed steels. I, I won't show that work today uh, because of a lack of, of time. Um, and of course, you know, that is really, that work is really interested in looking at the refining stage and ladle metallurgy. But then if we move down, down, downstream, of course, when it's time to cast it, first we have to uh, examine inclusion adhesion leading to some SEN clock clogging. Right, and, and then we'll look at uh, multi-scale, multi-physics multi modeling of solidification and hot tearing, uh, focusing on peritectic steels, then center line segregation, uh, and then we'll end with a summary. So if we want to look at the nozzle clogging process, first we have to have an understanding of, of how nozzle clogging actually happens and what are the different phenomena that may be in, involved. Right, so here, if we make a schematic and assume that the, the flow is in the horizontal direction uh, in these images here, right? So uh, in order to model the, the particle motion through the SEM, through the SEN, we need to have a macro scale model uh, that includes tur turbulent melt flow, uh, as well as particle tra transport. And what's going to happen, of course, is some of these particles are going to deposit onto the wall of the SEN, 
So then we also have to include a model for, for particle adhesion. Right. And then finally, uh, what's going to happen is as more and more particles deposit onto the wall, they're going to form a clog. And this clog, uh, of course, will, will form and grow. And then it will return back uh, and affect uh, the, the, the melt flow as it flows from the, from the tundish uh, into the, the mold. Okay, and, and so we, we decided to examine this process um, not by looking at the, at the process of continu continuous casting, but by creating a model uh, of a tank and a nozzle um, that would then be cast um, in, into a, a, a container below the, the nozzle. And so the, the, the model that we've created, of course, can, contains a tank that looks something like a tan dish, has a nozzle, and then below that is the, the mold. And so some of the, the physics that we need to include right, um, is melt flow near the wall and, of course, uh, in the, in, where there is a, a free stream. Um, we need to include uh, the bulk transport of particles. So we can do this um, using a particle force model uh, and a random walk model to have them stochastically move. And then we need to consider how do the particles uh, adhere to the wall. And so at this point, what we've done is we've de developed a phenomenological model um, based on the, this idea of stickiness and how sticky are these particles. We've got another PhD project that's just starting to actually look at how, how we can quantify what the stickiness is. But at this point, we're really just focusing on stickiness being a number that can be one, which, which would mean that the moment a particle touches the wall, it sticks, and zero, which is the moment the particle touches the wall, it rebounds away to continue on in, in the flow. So here we, we have a, a schematic showing some of the dimensions of our tank and our nozzle. And so here we, we used a, a nozzle a geometry that we found in the, the literature. And then on top of that, we placed a tank that was sufficiently large uh, to ap approximate uh, uh, flow from a ton dish into a nozzle during con continuous casting. And then we per perform three different sim simulations. And these three simulations uh, had variable, um, uh, we, we filled the, the tank to different heights to then, get, uh, to then uh, approximate different tank pressures. So we called uh, one high, a mid, and a low. Right. And so the re result of that was we got different conditions uh, for fluid flow within the tank and the nozzle, which will, of course, result in different particle tra transport and stickiness. So we in included a large number of particles here, um, you know, two points, specifically 2.75 e to the 8, uh, which, which represents a very large value, of course, something like 55 times greater than what is reported in the, the literature to see where and how the, the particles would, would move and end up. Now, the particles don't in, interact. So the idea of what one with, with each other. So the idea of having a lot of particles allows us to e examine the uh, effects of different stickiness um, in a way that does not require an extreme amount uh, of computational time and thus computational cost. And so then we, you, you, you can see on the, on the, the bottom of the slide right here, we used a number of di different stickiness factors or stickiness prob probabilities to decide if the particle would stick to the wall or not. From nearly zero, because the, the model doesn't allow zero, uh, all the way up to a sticking probability of, of one. So the way the simulation was 
can conduct it is first the fluid was allowed to flow uh, for one second, which was the time it took to reach steady state. So the flow profile was then fro frozen, and then we inserted part the particles. The particles then moved through this velocity field. And then we ran the simulation for an additional 10 seconds, and then we looked at where the particles uh, were, were stuck. So we can examine the different velocity pro profiles, and now we can see from this the importance of the, the tank. And so the arrows here don't represent the velocity magnitude, but they, they represent the velocity direction. And so what, whereas the, the colors here uh, is what represents the, the fluid velocity. And so what we, we see is that at high pressure, right, we get uh, relatively uniform flow throughout uh, the, the tundish entering as we enter the mold. When we go to uh, a mid-range pre pressure or we fill the tank halfway, we, we can see now we're starting to get more lateral flow um, as the fluid moves uh, from different areas of the tank into the nozzle. And then finally, when we're at uh, low pressure, we get a lot of lateral flow um, throughout the tank and then also into as the, the particles are entering the nozzle. Certainly this top part of the nozzle here is seeing considerable lateral flow um, in comparison to the other two geometries. So we, we can run these simulations, like I mentioned, for a, a whole different set of stickiness factors. And what we see really are two different regimes. And so one regime where the sticking probability is very low, right? And when, when the sticking probability is very low, we see that there is a, a significant uh, effect of stickiness prob probability on the number of deposited fact, uh, uh, par particles. And above a certain threshold, the stickiness, the number of deposited particles is relatively insensitive to the stickiness. And so it's really important if we're cons can considering nozzle clogging during uh, this uh, within uh, an SEN to understand what are the stickiness of our various particles. And that that's why the, we, we started this new P PhD pro project. And, uh, much of the literature that exists, what was assumed was a stickiness pro pro probability of one. And so by looking at how the stickiness probability varies, we see the importance of understanding uh, how our inclusions are behaving within the melt. So the other thing that is interesting is to look at where the particles are deposited. And so here we're looking at one example for a stickiness factor of 0.25, right? And so here we can see now um, at, uh, that, of course, some particles end up in the cone, right? Some of them end up in the tapered section, and then other ones end up in the straight sec sections. And so what we can see here is that as we vary the inlet pressure, of course, particles will end up in, di in, diff in different places, right? And so here, if, if we look at where the particles are ending up, what we see is that for particles one, uh, for, for, sorry, for the high pressure and the mid pressure, we get a, a similar pattern. Right, uh, we had similar flow patterns, and the particles are ending up in, in sim similar places. For the low pressure case, we had much more lateral flow, right? And so the re result of that then is we get much deeper deposition of the particles, so that they're not ending up solely in the in the cone, but they're really traveling much deeper and filling up the tapered section uh, as well as the, the straight section below that, which are the, the narrowest points and thus are, are most susceptible to, to nozzle clog clogging. Okay, so the, the last in, interesting thing that we can do is we can 
uh, briefly compare these results uh, to experimental data. And so what we can see here, uh, if we look in the literature, right, we know that most of the intermetallics deposit on the tapered section of the nozzle, and that's the result that we're getting here. So at least from a back of the envelope or first, or first approximation, we're getting a good comparison, right, between what our model is telling us uh, and what the, the literature is showing. And part of this new PhD project that we started on stickiness will in include taking nozzles um, from the local steel plants here at, at different times uh, and looking to, to see where have these clogs uh, started to develop. Okay, so after we move after we move metal uh, from the ladle through the tundish and into the mold, of course, now we have to cast it, right? And we want to ensure that our cast product is has has minimal defects so that we can ensure that the the quality is high and the the product throughput remains quite quite high. And also we want to cast without defects as fast as possible. Right. And so what I'd like to talk about next then uh, is a model that we've de developed um, that uh, was originally used in aluminum alloys and we've modified it and exported it here to look at steels uh, where we model uh, the, the multi-physics state of solidification um, at the MISO scale. And here, what we're particularly interested in for this study, we were particularly interested in peritectic steel grades, right? Um, and, and so the, the the reason behind looking at the at solidification in this way is that it allows us to examine the process of solidification while also examining microstructural tra transitions that occur um, when we have hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of grains. There are very good models out there today that look at the process scale, right? There are very good models that tell us about microstructural development, but we also need to have models that can bridge those scales to look at how does fluid flow influence the process, uh, how does solidification and the formation of grain clusters uh, aff affect the occurrence of, of defects? And so the, the model that we've de de developed has a number of different components, uh, right? So we, we, we've used uh, a model uh, from the group at Colorado School of Mines um, to, be, to un understand the solidification uh, within a, a, the continuous casting process. And so for a given set of input parameters, how does temperature evolve uh, from the liquidus to the solidus? And how does fraction solid evolve um, over that same range um, in different areas of the, of the slab being, being cast? Um, also because we're at, we, we want to be able to to look at both the liquid and the solid, we need to generate some mic microstructure. And then, so we, as, as I'll show in a moment, we use uh, a, a technique to create fully solidified uh, equiac structure. Um, then we have a dendritic solidification model to simulate solidification behavior within a sim single grain. Um, from all of this, we get we get a geometry at a specified solid fraction, right? And then from that, we couple models of deformation and fluid flow um, to ultimately, uh, in the first example that I'll give, uh, will be to look at uh, hot, hot tearing and semi-solid def deformation. Okay, so if we first start by generating the microstructure, um, the way that we do this is, is uh, using a Veroni diet diagram, right, or a nearest neighbor diet diagram. And so the idea here is we can put seeds 
that represent the center uh, uh, of a grain. And then we space fill to around the space nearest to that grain, nearest to that center, and that represents an individual grain. And then we mesh those, those polyhedra that result, and the result then is we get a, a you know, the example on the left is, is in 2D, right? But if we look in 3D, what, what we end up with then is a 3D geometry that looks something like uh, equiax grains when they are fully solidified. Okay, so now we have the fully solidified structure, but that's not really uh, of interest for research in solidification, right? And so what we do then is for each of these grains, they're sub, sub, subdivided uh, a number of times until ult, ult, ultimately we reach these tet tetrahedral elements. So here we have a grain. We then subdivide the grain into small, smaller polyhedra until ultimately uh, we get a te tetrahedral element. And then from this tetrahedral element using that geometry, uh, what we then carry out is we use um, the, we use the average volume method to simulate dendritic solidification. And so this allows us then to, to simulate multiple phases in a, geom in, in a geometric sense, right? So we can form the, the del delta phase, right? And then the gamma, the gamma phase that form that, that Certainly in peritectic grades, we'll de decorate the delta ferrite dendrites. We'll have in intradandritic liquid, and of course, we have extra dendritic liquid outside of the, da the da dendrite tip. And so in this way, we simulate solidification of each equ equiax grains. And we're able then to form semi-solid mic microstructure um, and, and here we can see a 2D cross section of what form. So we have the del delta, delta phase at the center in gray. We then form gamma to de decorate to these grains with liquid remaining in, in between. Okay. Now, now that we have the semi-solid geometry, Right. If we want to investigate defects, we really need to look at deformation and fluid flow. And so for fluid flow, um, we, we have to consider, given that the material is dendritic, we have to can consider both interdendritic flow and extra -dend dendritic flow. And so we've done that by developing a model that considers both pos posoi flow between parallel plates and Darcy's flow within the dendrite on envelope. And so we then couple this fluid flow to a semi-solid def deformation model. And so what one can do is one can take the solid part, right? And one can divide that up into a set of finite L L L elements and use the pressures resulting from the fluid flow model as boundary conditions on each of these L elements and then apply deformation. And the result of that uh, is going to be a structure that a semi-solid structure that will deform. Okay. And so with that then we'll we'll know how the semi-solid's going to respond. We'll, we'll be able then to un understand what is the fluid pressure within the various channels. And we can look at how does that pressure then compare to a cavitation pre pre pressure. And a simple expression of the cavitation pressure is of course the Young-Laplace equation, right? Uh, which then tell, which tells us the overpressure required to overcome the capillary forces uh, at the liquid atmosphere interface but you you could of course use it and anywhere within the material to to simulate how a crack is going to form and grow so well once a, once the loss in pressure exceeds a certain amount the a crack will develop so let's look at some uh results that we can get from this this model 
And so first thing we, we can do is we can look at how does carbon content um, affect the, the, the semi-solid stru structure that exists at, at the mesoscale. And so we've carried out these simulations on a 3D domain that contains a thousand grains that has a total domain size of 125 cubic millimeters, so five millimeters on a side. Right, and so what, what we see here is that uh, um, depending on the carbon content, right, of course, non-peritectic, everything is basically solid, right? Um, when we have uh, the hypoperitectic and the, the peritectic cases, we, we can see that there's, there's very thin liquid channels that remain. Um, but the liquid channels are still con continuous, as you can make out here. And so the result of that is it's very difficult to, to feed these alloys. So any deformation will then lead to a crack, right? When we look at the hyperperitectic case, we can see now there are some, the liquid channels are quite large. And so it's easy for liquid to, to, to flow, uh, to, to not form a crack. Okay, now, now let's look at some more in interesting results when we couple the fluid flow with deformation. And so here, um, just, I have a video to show, see what happens here. Uh, see what the video will show. Okay, so here what we've done is we've um, so we we created this semi-solid geometry. It's at uh, a fraction solid of 0.9. It contains about 2,000 grains, with a grain density that gives us a grain size of, of 100 microns. And so if we deform the structure, right? So what what we can can see is that although there is not a whole lot of of stress buildup. In the liquid channels that forms, we're, we're starting to deform these more and more. And the colors here re represent where a crack is going to, going to form. And so ultimately, the structure will deform and then a crack will form, though not a crack in the traditional sense through the solid, but through all of the interdendritic liquid. Okay. And so what we can do is we can plot the average pressure in the liquid channels as a function of strain. And we can also plot the average stress uh, over the entire con con construct if we def deform this structure in dis displacement mode. Right? And so what we can see then is the effect of alloy composition on on def deformation, right? And so if we have a, a low carbon system, iron 0.07 weight percent carbon, there's very little uh, stress, there's, there's very little loss of pressure in the liquid channels. And consequently, the stress required for deformation um, remains very, very low. If we compare that now to the a high carbon case, Fe 0.18 weight percent carbon, right, what we see now is we get much lower, much greater loss of pressure, which is going to make it much more susceptible to crack formation, right? And con conversely, we get much larger stresses. And so that's going to then lead to more depth, depth deformation and ultimately more cracking that may occur. Okay, so we, we can validate this model um, by extracting from this um, an, um, one, you know, something like a tensile strength. So here we have a comparison between some uh, our experimental results in blue 
uh, sorry, our sim simulation results in blue and experimental results as being yellow, uh, red circles. And what we see is a very, very good, good match in the region where the model uh, is, is most appropriate. That is, you know, a fraction solids of about 0.75 to about 0.95. And as we get to very, very high values of fraction solid, um, the amount of brid bridging between the grains is going to be highly dependent on the local solidification conditions. And it's and it's likely here that that seal at all had different conditions than than we simulated, which then led them to have high, higher tensile strength. But the more in interesting thing that one can do is one can then look at how will the model respond. So can 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 we carry out some sort of uh, phenomenological study, right, to look at how does the model respond where under different can conditions, right? And, and so here I've looked at the stress part of some stress strain curves where what we've done is we if we come back to the young Laplace equation, right, it has this cosine phi. And of course phi re represents um, the misorientation between any bit, bit well in the within the model it's going to represent the misorientation between the two the two grains. And we know that you know when misorientation is low, the boundaries will be attractive, and when misorientation is high, um, the boundary grain boundaries will be repulsive because of the excess free energy that exists. And so here we we can see the effects of grain misorientation on semi-solid def, def, deformation. And there is a can, considerable change, right, in 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 the tensile in the the stress strain curve or the amount of stress that we need to apply to deform the material when our, when we have a much large what much more attractive bound boundaries and so what that's saying is that up here we have many grains that are attractive so we have a lot of bridging that has occurred so the the material can withstand uh, much more stress whereas when the, where when there are much fewer bound attractive boundaries the material will much more readily um, deep 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 deform we can also look at the effect of grain boundary and energy. And the in interesting way to do that is to look at how does grain boundary energy vary with sulfur content? And so by, uh, sorry, I'll say that differently. How, how do the stress strain curves vary when we vary the sulfur content? We know that sulfur content affects the grain boundary and energy. And so what, what we see here is that once you, in the initial state, there is not much difference. But if we vary sulfur from zero to a very large value, of course, of one weight percent, right, we see that when, when the grain boundary energy or, or the sulfur content is high, the material is much weaker than when the sulfur content is, is low. And, and so all of that then is going to lead to different deformation behaviors and thus different pr propensities for hot tearing. Okay, so the, the last thing I'd like to quickly talk about um, is center line seg seg segregation. And so the, this model that we've developed um, not only allows us to study hot tearing and deformation, but we can use, we, we, we can add additional physics, you know, a, a solute transport model and couple that with fluid flow to, to look at center line seg, seg, segregation and quickly compare different results uh, for, for diff, different kin, conditions. And so what we've done here is we've introduced uh, a, another model, uh, right, or, or a, another field variable, so the, the solute tra transport equation. Okay, so what it allows us to do is to look at solute partitioning at the grain scale and solute transport at the cast at the scale of the casting. And so while in the models of deformation involved uh, a representative volume element, 
Here we've modeled the entire semi-solid region from the liquidus to the solidus, and we've broken it down into sub-volumes to make the computational uh, aspects tractable. And so what we can see then, if we do that, is first of all, we can get some results as we expect to see, right? So at low solid fraction, we have little center line seg segregation, right? So this is looking in the y direction, which is the thickness direction, and the z direction is along the length of the caster. And if we move all the way up to uh, a fraction solid of 0.98, so almost at the end of, of the metallurgical length, right, we see that we've now developed extensive uh, amounts of centerline segregation for this alloy, which contains a uh, nominal composition of 1.55 manganese and, and 0.1. Uh, carbon. So then we were interested uh, in validating this result, this this model, and what we were really in, interested in doing is looking at different tech tech techniques for for modeling. You know, a lot of the work that I've shown has been at this meso scale, and to do a meso scale model requires uh, large, relatively large scary scale area maps for alloy for looking at alloy comp composition. And so, traditionally, to get detailed information on segregation, you know, one would do EPMA or LIBS, but they they give us very very small uh, small areas from from which to to do the uh, for, from which to characterize segregation. And they're really excellent for microsegregation, but not for segregation at the mesoscale. And so we've been looking at two different techniques, uh, laboratory macroscale uh, X-ray fl fl fluorescence, and also then using the synchrotron here in Canada, the Canadian light source. Um, they, they have a beam line there that's called the Vespers beam line that combines X-ray diffraction with X-ray fl fluorescence. So doing that, we're able to get these large area maps. And so the advantage of uh, the MXRF te technique is that we, we can acquire these large maps, you know, 90 by 90 microns. At, at a scale of, a, of about 250 micron pic, pixel pitch. Right? At the Canadian light source, we can also acquire these large scale, scale area maps um, at a pixel pitch of 25 mi microns. And so here we, we use the same sample as we did for MXRF, and we looked at a couple of different areas here and acquired a highly detailed uh, six, six, six segregation patterns. Okay. So, what what I'd like to do uh, quickly then, since uh, we're nearing the end of our our time, is just look look at one example first. First of all. Um, which is one, one of the areas uh, that we had, which we called air, Area 4. And here, if you compare the MXRF data and the CLS data, you can see that you get a very good match between the two sets of, of data. So multiple techniques can give us very good uh, comp complementary information. Uh, and really, then, we can use this to to val to validate our, our model, right? So that's what we did here. Um, so you'll have to excuse me, I've, but I've had to it was, since we're recording the, the presentation, I've had to put a box here around the the legend. Um, but what you can see here, one example of an area map that we get is shown here, right, where we can see clearly see some center line segregation here shown in red, along with other areas around that where, that are deprived in solute, but, but a very sharp band. And if we compare that to our mesoscale model, right, so here we have the experimental data point shown in black and the mesoscale model shown here in blue. And the, what we can see is that the predicted composition uh, in the discrete liquid channels 
it compares really, really nicely against the experimentally measured pro profile. What we can see is that the, the experimentally measured profile shows minima within the grains and maxima at the grain boundaries. And our model only pre provides us with the sense of se segregation within the, the liquid channels. But we, we, we see a really exceptional map and comparison from, from these two aspects. Okay, so now we can use the, this model, right? And what, what we can see uh, we, uh, in doing so is again, we, we can examine a couple different phenomenological states um, by doing some parametric studies. And so here we look at the influence of grain size, right? And so what we can see here is that with, uh, let's say eight, 800 micron grains, we get a very, very large band of six, six, six segregation that that forms. Now remember, the z-axis here could have been, or and perhaps should have been, replaced with fraction solid, right? And so, really, if we're interested in segregation, we're only looking at this bottom part of the band of the of the contour plot down here because that is the final area to solidify. And so with 800 micron grain equiaxed, I have to admit, so equiax grains, we get a lot of segregation that occurs. But when we go to larger grain sizes, 1,000 microns and 2,000 microns, we see then that the, the segregation pattern is becoming much, much less. Now, the, the more in, in interesting plots is to look at the influence of soft reduction. And so the, the fluid flow equations that I showed in part two, um, one can also include an effect of def deformation into those e equations. And what one can do then is one can investigate soft reduction as well as, let's say, role misalignment on the on center line seg 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 segregation. And so what we've done here is we've plotted here, um, how does uh, soft reduction affect these values of seg segregation you, using something that we've coined the equivalent soft reduction. And so that, this is an, an, indu an industry term and, and it really represents uh, how soft reduction is carried out in industry, which is a deformation distance per unit length of the shell surface. And so it's units, of, it would have units of millimeters per meter. So a negative value here of soft reduction is the traditional value, right? Where we, where we reduce the, the strand during solidification. Right, a positive value could represent role mis misalignment. And so what we see here is exactly what we, we would expect in industrially, right? So if we apply soft reduction, we get a we reduce or lower the amount of se center line seg segregation. If we have no soft reduction, well, we get segregation. And if we have positive values, which you could, which is, you know, a pulling apart of this structure. Uh, which you could have for role misalignment or for some other reasons, we get a widening and an intensity of the, the center line seg, seg, segregation. Right, so, oops. Right, so here were the areas that we were look, looking at. So the these three areas down, down, down here. Okay. So if we can conclude, right, so I, I hope I've given you a bit of an overview and some understanding of a suite of fundamental models that we're developing here at McMaster to better understand the solidification of alloy steels and how alloying elements influence solidification defects. So we've looked at some features of, that we need to include when modeling um, no, nozzle clog, clog, clogging, right? The importance of this pro probability sticking factor, and also um, including simulations of flow that not only take into account the the SEN itself, 
but the tundish up, up above. And then we've looked at um, how we can model hot tearing and center line segregation via a mesoscale multi-physics approach. And, and I hope I've given you just a little bit of a flavor of understanding of how we can quantify material properties without doing difficult experiments and how we can use these approaches to perform parametric studies to help correlate defects to the underlying microstructure and processing conditions. So thanks for your attention. Thanks, Andre. A wonderful talk, and uh, I hope uh, you'll have a lot of questions. Uh, um, anyone, please feel free to ask uh, questions. Thank, okay, yeah. thank you very much. I'll I'll kick off if I may. Um, so thank you very much for the the presentation. Very enjoyable to to listen to. Um, in terms of the, you know, for example, the modelling of the hot tearing and, and segregation behaviour, at the moment you're modelling based on equiax grains with the internal dendritic structure. I was wondering what the opportunity is to extend this for directional um, dendritic growth, and particularly when we consider, say, some of the thin slab, more strip castings, where we won't necessarily have significant equiax solidification structures. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, so we, we have developed a, a geometry model for columnar growth. We're still working through some of the details. So uh, to, to develop um, the model, especially for center line segregation, to look um, um, in, and, and how we, we can couple that together. It's, it's not a question of writing the equations. It's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's more of a question of ensuring, is this approach modeling the, the physical phenomena that exists during center line, that, that exists in thin slab cast cast And I'm not quite, quite sure that we're, we're there yet. I, I think it's likely going to be possible for center line se segregation, which I, I think it would be a great ben benefit. I'm I'm less confident for in terms of modeling of hot tearing because the the assumptions that we've made of this tetrahedral grain struct structure to model hot tearing, they really don't exist when you have a large amount of of columnar grains and I don't think that the interaction at the grain boundaries which allowed which we could which we could 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 model using uh, you you using elements uh, the, these multi-point can strain elements and having bridging related to attractive uh, and repulsive grains that exists for equiax globular grains. I, I don't think that applies in columnar structures. So that, that's going to be a lot more diff, difficult to do. Yes, thank you. Yes, it, it's definitely becomes quite interesting when you start to have you know, the, the columnar and, and, and then also not necessarily fully perpendicular, but because you've also got then the flow influence or the direction of certification. And so that three-dimensional connectivity, if you like, uh, particularly with the interdendritic liquid, I can see that if the next scale up, next challenge to, to try and tackle. Thank you. May I ask a question? Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Andrew. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't actually uh, join you at the beginning, but it's a very excellent talk and it covers a broad range of certification study. One, one probably thing I want to discuss with you is in, in this central line segregation modeling, and then uh, in particular when you apply soft reduction, uh, those uh, equax grains probably can probably will move along this flow, and I wonder whether how you uh, accommodate the movement of this equax grain. Uh, in this probably in the soft reduction uh, uh, stage. So that that's uh, another good question, and the, and the short answer is is no. So the idea behind 
the this uh, multi-physics uh, mesoscale model is is that we 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 know from you know a, a hundred years of doing metallurgy we 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 have an idea of what the final microstructure looks like and so we before we started to develop these models, we, we were somewhat lim, li, limited in ways to bridge the process scale with the scale of the microstructure. And so the decision that we made to bridge this scale was to say that we knew what the microstructure was a priori. And so, so by incorporating grain motion, um, we would then know we would then no longer know the microstructure a priori and so there are already other good models that exist for looking at yeah. such phenomena but they take a lot of time and we 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 were looking we are looking for ways um, that we can run run models to make predictions with relatively low comp computational cost so I, yeah okay thank you yeah thank you yeah yeah Any other questions? Andre, about this Vespers uh, beam line, you mentioned that it can do both uh, diffraction and uh, XRF simultaneously, right? Um, what about the time resolutions for these both techniques? Would it be possible to do simultaneously? Will it be different, difficult? Uh, I believe I, I, I'm not an expert, um, and in fact, with COVID, you know, we could hardly go to do these experiments. But um, I believe that, that the beamline was designed to work to to be able to do these experiments simultaneously, right? And and in that way, they get fast uh, computational yeah. data. And, and so we, we've done some other work, with, which I didn't show here, um, and the, even down to, to very, very low resolution, the, the match is truly excellent between this technique, which allows us to make these very large maps, and EPMA and, and, and LIBS. So a lot of semi-solid work you carried out mostly, I think, uh, aluminum copper, right, uh, with in situ X-ray imaging. Did you do anything with steels as well? Uh, no. Um, so we we we've done some work, uh, you know, um, mostly with with Peter Lee uh, at looking at steel solidification. We're we're developing capabilities at the Canadian Light Source right now to be able to do such experiments. Um, but everything takes time, and with COVID, it takes twice as long. One is COVID, another is steel, because it's very high temperature compared to uh, doing things with aluminum. Yeah. Yes, yes, but but that can be overcome too. You yeah. just yeah. yeah. Dr. Progress, can I have <coughs> just? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, Professor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Professor Andrew, it was very fantastic to hear you. Very good models, especially I was just when I was looking at your initial model that is a sink logging. And uh, you invoke a concept of particle sticking probability. It is indeed a very innovative approach. But uh, what I see from your uh, results that particle sticking probability at 0.25, you got much success to compare the results with the experiments, isn't it? Uh, 0.25. So I was wondering that uh, uh, when the, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. That, yeah. Yeah. So what I would say is that th this was certainly not a quantitative comparison. My whole the point of this slide was really just to show that we are on the right track, right, um, and that there is still a lot of work to carry out a detailed analysis uh, to yeah. to validate the model. Yeah. What I wanted to tell that is the when you say the probability, the sticking probability is less. That means that is the particle mostly rebound and only very few particles stick 
like that 25 percent uh, like 0.25 sticking probability is it that's why you want to mean that is the particle will not stick it doesn't stick but you get uh, more closer uh, that, is that the thing so what it means is that oh, yeah. is that when a when the particle interacts with the wall because it, um, this PhD is project is ongoing and the student is in that, that is his next job to make particles interact with each other. But at this point, we're interested, we, we looked at how do particles stick to the wall and every time the particle hits a wall, it had a one in four chance of sticking. So, you, you know, particles will hit the wall of the SEN multiple times. And so it's not that only 25% of the particles could stick. It is just that they have a one in four chance of sticking if they interacted with the wall. Okay, okay, okay. That's fine. And then and the particle to particle interaction, he will take care of later on, right? That well, was that, that, that's the, the next job, yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I don't have any more, but I can see that uh, <laughs> Michael has said that he, he'd like to follow okay. up um, later on. He's had to leave, but um, following up. So Michael is um, a member of our group who does uh, modeling work. So it looks like he would be interested uh, in some of the work. And I just wanted to say, just in case nobody else has any questions, to make sure I have the opportunity to say thank you very much indeed. Um, thoroughly yeah. enjoyed listening to, to the talk and seeing the, the approaches that are being taken and also to understand some of the challenges um, in terms of where things are. And I, I did have just one final question from, from me anyway, and that's when you were looking at um, some of the, 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 the hot tearing simulations you showed about you know, the, the boundaries and for example the role of sulfur, which I thought was quite nice to see uh, the influence. And this is from my ignorance because I don't know. Is there data on the influence of other elements that are present? Um, and I know sulfur is a particularly troublesome one in that regard. But um, if you're talking about you know, um, steels, the higher alloy steels, and um, steels with residual elements in, etc., you know, is that something that can be incorporated into the model now? So that 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 could definitely be incorporated into the model. There, there is some data. I should say we were very lucky to find data that showed how sulfur affected the solid liquid interface. So, um, and so I think that what the, the challenge would be to See, see exactly what other data is out there. And in some of the more highly alloyed steels, the effects are going to be in, interrelated. And so it's, it's, it's going, it would be difficult to say, right, we, we, we add more of this and less of that. And these equations that were developed for binary eternary systems may not then apply because of because of the in interaction of other of these surface activities. I think this is one area that because modeling has advanced so far, I, I hope that you know we can have more engagement between experimentalists and modelers to identify you know what, what it is that um, now it's no longer this we've measured this can models catch up. It's actually the models sort of demand we need this information and validation and I hope we can have more and more of those discussions to bring the two developments together. That That's very true and that's why we started this PhD project to look at the stickiness factor and and of course what we will be able to do will be nothing like the actual industrial process but at least it will give us some guidance. Um, we're going to use we have I believe you have one also uh, uh, one of these high temperature uh, laser scanning uh, confocal microscopes yeah. and so we're going to use that uh, we're and we're in the process of developing a technique to see how do inclusion stick and can we quantify how well they stick together and 
And that, that's a very simplified system, but it will give us more information than what we have today, right? Which is, which is nil, right? Which requires us then to use a, a, prob a probability bet between zero and, and, and one. Yeah, super. Anyway, thank you very, thank you very much indeed. Okay, if no more questions, then uh, I once again thank Sandre for this wonderful talk and for your time. Um, and thanks a lot. And uh, Claire, any concluding remarks? We can close it. No, yeah, I think that just just to finish off, and um, you know, perhaps a, a thought, Andre, about whether you're willing or happy for this to be included on Harry Badisha's YouTube channel. Um, no, don't decide now. Just just raise it so that it can be thought about because it's really nice. Um, also, quite a few people from from the group who might not have been able to attend will be able to catch up catch up later. Um, but again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prakash, as well for organising everything and uh, to everybody who's still on the call. Look forward to seeing you at our next talk in the new year. Yeah, thank thanks you so much, everyone. Yeah. Bye now. Thank you for the introduction for the in invitation.